When it all goes to plan, taking a train can be a relaxing and a pretty pleasant way to travel. But here in the UK, the reality is that it can often become a bit of a nightmare. Hell, stress. When it goes wrong, it goes spectacularly wrong. 2017 saw the most train delays in nearly 15 years. And just to add insult to injury, as the service seems to be getting worse, ticket prices just keep going up. If you're commuting from, let's say, Wokingham to London for work, it's a 32-mile journey which takes just over an hour. A standard year season ticket will cost you over £3,800, but in France, commuting roughly the same distance from Etom to Paris for one year will cost you less than a quarter of that. It doesn't stop there. For the same price as the British season ticket, you can get unlimited train travel anywhere in Germany for a whole year. Members of Parliament have said the UK's rail system is no longer fit for purpose, and a lot of the British public have had enough. In a recent survey, more than half said that they think the current system is a failure. So why are Britain's trains so bad? A lot of people say that one of the main reasons that trains are so rubbish here is because they're privatised. But back in the day, they used to be nationalised. So could returning to the old way of doing things solve the problem? That's what we're going to try and figure out. But first things first. Understanding the UK train network does require a short history lesson. In the 19th century, Britain was the world pioneer of train travel. This man, George Stevenson, was known as the father of the railways. The inventor and engineer built the world's first ever public railway in 1825 in the north of England. Five years later, he built a railway linking two cities, Liverpool and Manchester. It paved the way for a revolution. In less than a century, Britain built around 20,000 miles of track across the country. That's nearly enough track to span the entire globe. By 1920, there were about 120 different private rail companies. A year later, the government stepped in and merged the network into four regional companies. Then, during the Second World War, as part of the war effort, the Big Four began working together. The concentration of industrial life on work for the war has continued unceasingly. And after the war came a new Labour government with some big ideas about how to change British society. They created a universal healthcare and welfare system and nationalised key industries like energy and the railways. On January 1st, 1948, the Big Four became British Rail. The taxpayer owned it, the government controlled it. Nationalising the railway meant making money wasn't so important, providing a good service was. And most importantly, any money British Rail did make was invested back into the railways. For a while, the trains, the tracks, the buildings, the bridges, everything was completely nationalised. But British Rail lasted less than 50 years. For the majority of that time, the Conservative Party were in power and gradually different parts of the service were sold off to private companies. Then, finally in 1994, they started to privatise the trains themselves, essentially ending British Rail for good. Today, pretty much every major rail service is operated by a private company. So before we start looking at the problems that we have with railways today, we need to make something clear. This isn't an argument about history and whether the old nationalised British Rail is better or worse than what we have today. That kind of comparison just isn't possible. Take the way that train services are monitored. Some of that's changed over time and there are some historical factors that just don't exist anymore. And you have to remember that privatisation of British Rail happened gradually. It's really important to know the history, to understand just how much the system has changed. Comparing trains from the 1950s to 80s to today, it's just not fair and it's just not useful. It's a bit like comparing apples with oranges. So, let's get into why trains are so bad today. First of all, there's franchising. Now, when the trains were privatised, the government split the railway up into different regions. Private companies can bid to run franchises within these regions, kind of like an auction. The idea is that the government sets the terms of a franchise, a bidding war creates competition, and then the best company should win. But in reality, things don't always work out perfectly, leaving passengers stuck in the middle. Let's take Southern Rail, for example. In 2018, Southern Rail was officially named the worst performing train service in the UK for three years in a row. At least 8% of their trains were either completely cancelled or they were more than half an hour late. 
Now, when they bid for their franchise back in 2014, they were up against four other companies. None of those four companies offered exactly what the government wanted, but the government needed somebody to run the line. And even though experts warned that it could cause huge problems, they offered the contract anyway. That's part of the reason why Southern Service has been plagued by delays and cancellations since. Letting private companies compete to run the trains was meant to allow healthy competition, driving up standards and lowering costs. The situation with Southern shows that the franchise system doesn't always work out. And once a company secures a contract, there's basically no competition. Now that's not to say private companies can't run good services. If you look at customer satisfaction, the highest ranked operator is Grand Central, a private company, and it's been voted the best value for money operator six years in a row. But it's important to point out that Grand Central is a bit of a specialist case. Instead of running a whole franchise, they take slots in the schedule of someone else's, running their own trains on a rival's tracks. There are a few companies that do it, and the supporters of it say that it increases competition between companies. But given that only one train can run on a track at any given time, it's debatable as to how competitive it really is. Either way, companies like Grand Central are rare. Less than 1% of all rail miles travelled by passengers are on trains operated like this. So the franchising system doesn't guarantee healthy competition. And then there's the issue of who runs and operates the trains. The train companies, like all private businesses, are trying to make money. Take cross-country trains. In 2017, it made £23 million in profit. £20 million of that was paid out in dividends to its shareholders. But critics of the privatised system say this can lead to services suffering. They argue that more money needs to be invested to improve services and to keep ticket prices down. Trade unions point the finger specifically at profiteering, saying that it can lead to reduced staffing, cost-cutting, safety issues. But businesses obviously disagree with that. They say that they're best placed to run an efficient system. And as we've already seen, customer satisfaction for private companies can be really high, but then it can also be like Southern's. And on top of that, the government still heavily subsidises Britain's railways by about £5 billion over the last five years. Train companies making big profits can be hard for passengers to accept when so much taxpayer money is being put into the railway network. Then there's the third factor, the tangible, physical parts of the British railway network. And in some ways, this is the most difficult issue to fix, because replacing failing infrastructure is expensive and it doesn't happen overnight. So York Station was built in the 1870s, when Queen Victoria was on the throne. It's a really beautiful example of the unique heritage of British railways. But that is also part of the problem, because a lot of our rail network is really old. This all looks lovely, I know, but it's also difficult and expensive to upgrade to match modern technology. Lots of trains in Europe run on electric tracks, meaning they can go faster and run efficiently. But only a third of Britain's routes are actually electrified, which ranks us as one of the worst countries in the EU. So how do we make things better? Is it just a case of making the rail services public again? Maybe. But that won't solve the infrastructure problems that we just spoke about because they're kind of nationalised already. You see, the private companies only actually own the trains themselves. But things like the tracks and the signals, well, they're owned by a separate company called Network Rail. And Network Rail, well, it's technically owned by the government. Now, OK, this isn't like the old British Rail. The government has less control than it used to. But 60% of train delays in the UK are the responsibility of network rail. The point is, even if you nationalise the trains tomorrow, it wouldn't magically fix the problem with signals and tracks. That requires loads of money. And Britain already spends more on the rail network than any other country in Europe. Some say private companies are still the best way to run the railways. They just need more competition. That could mean more companies like Grand Central, on top of that, they argue that train companies are better placed to know what their customers want, so they should have more say in what trains they run and when. The Labour Party have made the railways one of their main policy targets. Privatisation and outsourcing are now a national disaster zone. Jeremy Corbyn's party are backers of some form of nationalisation and say if they get into government, they'll bring the system into public ownership within five years. 
They say the only way to fix the system is to bring it under centralised control. So if there are problems with the trains like the ones we saw in May 2018, those involved wouldn't just be able to blame each other. Instead, a single organisation would be responsible and could lead to a better service. But not everyone's thrilled with Labour's plan. Critics say that the taxpayer would probably end up paying the price for the nationalisation. And there are plenty of people who will wistfully tell you that things were worse back in the days of British Rail. But as we said earlier, it's not as simple as comparing then and now. But there is one modern example of nationalisation that actually could prove useful, and that's East Coast, the line that this train is running on right now. Between 2007 and 2009, it was run by National Express, but they got into financial trouble and the government stepped in and took control. Under public ownership, customer satisfaction rose and it brought in nearly a quarter of a billion pounds, so it was widely viewed as a huge success. It was then put into private hands in 2015, but it hit further financial problems and was taken back under government control again. We can't know if nationalising all the train companies would be a success, just like we can't know if other forms of privatisation would be a success either. And whether private or national, companies are still reliant on the same ageing infrastructure, but they're not actually responsible for maintaining it. There's definitely no simple fix. But Parliament and the public agree that the system is broken and that it might be time to try something different. And for all of our European viewers wondering what a private rail service might be like, well, new rules are about to force all state rail firms to open their tracks to private companies. Lucky you. We recommend you take The Economist's advice. Don't do it like the British.